Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hoover Institution's new office in Washington, D.C. Hopefully, this will not be your last time here. Uh, we'll be doing, hopefully, a lot of events and this and other related topics. Hoover has a fairly broad policy bandwidth, and over the months and years ahead, you'll see evidence of that. So hopefully, you get on our list and receive information of our upcoming events. Um, my duties are to, aside for welcoming you, to introduce our speakers today. We have uh, a panel now, uh, how peaceful will our nuclear future be? Uh, we're going to have a working lunch featuring uh, Lord Brown, uh, former UK Minister of Defense and Vice Chairman of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, followed by another panel uh, approaching the tipping point, a global effort to forestall proliferation. So with that, we'll get started on our first panel. Uh, our moderator for this panel is Harvey Rushikoff, who specializes in national security, civil and military courts, terrorism, international law, civil liberties, and the U.S. Constitution. Anything else? That's a very, very broad bandwidth. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey currently chairs the Advisory Committee for the American Bar Association Standing Committee on Law and National Security and serves on the Board of Visitors for the National Intelligence University. Previously, he was a professor of law and national security studies at the Naval War College. He's a former member of the law firm Hale and Dorr, Supreme Court Fellow, Dean of the Law School in Rhode Island, and legal counsel to the Deputy Director of the FBI, where he focused on policies concerning national security and terrorism. He's also involved in the drafting of presidential decision directives in the national security area. And Harvey will have the duties of moderating the panel and keeping you guys in line in the audience. Mr. Charles Lutz currently is the director of the Center for the Study of Weapons of Mass Destruction at the National Defense University. Previously, Mr. Lutz served in the office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Policy. He was a senior advisor there, countering uh, weapons of mass destruction and acting principal director for nuclear and missile defense policy. He also served as director for counterproliferation and nonproliferation on the National Security Council staff under both Presidents George W. Bush and Obama. Mr. Lutz also served as Chief of Strategic Plans and later as Weapons of Mass Destruction Division Chief in the J-5 Directorate on the Joint Staff, Senior Military Fellow at NDU's Institute for National Strategic Studies, and he was a career Air Force pilot with over 3,000 hours in flight. And I'll hand, let me look at this correct here. Henry. Yeah, Henry Sikulski, I'm sorry, it's our next, uh, will be our next speaker. Uh, currently, he's Executive Director of the Nonproliferation Policy Education Center, a uh, Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit founded to promote a better understanding of strategic weapons proliferation issues uh, among policymakers, scholars, and the media. He's also Adjunct Professor at the Institute of World Politics here in Washington, D.C. Previously, and he's very proud of his affiliation, in 1980, he was a Public Affairs Fellow at the Hoover Institution in Palo Alto. From 89 to 93, he was Deputy for Nonproliferation Policy, and he received a Medal for Outstanding Public Service from Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney. He also served in the Office of the Secretary of Defense's Office of Net Assessment as a consultant to the National Intelligence Council and as a member of the CIA Senior Advisory Group. He also put some time in in the U.S. Senate uh, working for both the former Senators Gordon Humphrey and the uh, military aide to then Armed Service Committee member Dan Quayle. And finally, Greg Thielman is currently Senior Fellow, Arms Control Association for about the past six years. And before that, he used to work for four years as a Senior Professional Staffer on the Senate Select Committee on Intel. He was previously a U.S. Foreign Service Officer for about 25 years last serving as director of the Strategic Proliferation and Military Affairs Office at State's Bureau of Intelligence and Research. His foreign posts is Brazil, the, the old USSR, Germany, and his deputy director of the State Department's Office of German, Austrian, and Swiss Affairs. That sounds like a good good assignment. He was also special assistant to Ambassador Paul Luzzi, um, State Department advisor to the U.S. delegation at Geneva, INF, arms control negotiations, and finally, member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a former member of the Board of Directors of the Arms Control Association. So clearly we have a very well 
accomplished an expert panel, and I look forward to the discussion. Harvey, the floor is all yours. First, thank you so much for being so uh, sweet to host us here at the Hoop Institute. It's what the Hoop Institute, I think, is known for bringing um, important ideas to the public, and it's a long tradition, and I want to thank you for hosting in such elegant surroundings. It's very nice to be able to do theater. Uh, we're going to get right to it. I think we'll have Henry lead off, because Henry's book you have here is Underestimated, Our Not-So-Peaceful Nuclear Future. It's in the front. You can get a copy. Um, Henry is, and then we'll be followed with our commentaries with Chuck and then Greg, uh, and then we'll try to get the audience involved as quickly as possible, because I kind of recognize a number of people in the audience, and I think they'd have a lot to contribute in the dialogue. Um, Henry is uh, a combination of sort of uh, a Max Weber, as he does a typology for the debate, and he, like Max Weber, he goes a little bit farther. If you look at footnote on, I think it's 180, you'll see his hero, which is Elia Root. And Elia Root is extraordinary because I see there's some National War College uh, members in the audience. Elia Root was really the foundational stone for the National uh, War College. And I would say it's an individual who combines theory with practice. Uh, rather than just taking an academic analysis, what makes the Henry's book particularly intriguing is that he has some programmatic recommendations that he makes. And so I think we'll have a, a very fun discussion given the expertise on the panel. So Henry, why don't you kick it off and sort of lay out your argument. And I don't know if you're going to discuss anything of the New Deal that just took place with Iran. But uh, the other great event of, of course, July 14th is the uh, Bastille Day. So um, it's quite, I think, um, prophetic that we have both Bastille Day, the Iran deal, and Sikorsky all on the same day. <laughs> so why don't you kick it off? best not to bring up either of those topics, <laughs> and uh, partly because I'm not French, <laughs> and partly because if there is one disease that pervades the Beltway and its environs, it's excitement at a shallow level. And I think what we want to do is talk about life beyond Iran. We'll take questions on Iran. How's that? That's a pretty good topic. On Iran. Yes, well, yes. We but can also take questions on Iraq, which would be <laughs> very challenging. Too. Well, or any other country. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, this is an attempt to resist the excitement. Um, okay. First, let me just say that this book is uh, the, the second of two. Uh, the first book uh, that I did, uh, which is, I think, entitled uh, Best of Intentions, Americans, America's... Uh, campaign against strategic weapon proliferation uh, was a history. And the reason I uh, wrote that, uh, besides not having any books to assign in my class on this topic, uh, was that I thought I would actually focus on nonproliferation uh, as a lifetime career. And it was a somewhat shaky proposition because it didn't seem like a very serious field. By the way, I still think it's not quite there. Uh, and the reason why is there was no history. You know, any serious field has got to have a history. This didn't. Now, partly it's excusable. I mean, the reason it is is how do you do a history of things that didn't happen? It's, it's kind of a problem. So, I mean, it's hard enough to try to explain what happened and why, much less why something didn't happen. So uh, I wrote the book with a slightly different angle, uh, and that was, well, what did our various uh, efforts to prevent proliferation, what did they assume the problem was? You know, what was the war next that was so worrisome, and what were they going to do to prevent that outcome? And it turns out, if you get the problem wrong, the solution actually may not help. Uh, it can make things worse. Now, just to give you a tidbit, uh, in one of the programs, Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace program, the assumed problem was a massive attack against all of America's cities, basically the 100 largest cities. And therefore, uh, the program was uh, aimed at preventing a massive attack. Net-net uh, was, uh, it wasn't so concerned about the spread of a few weapons. It was mostly concerned about preventing 
the spread of a massive number of nuclear weapons. And as a result, the institutions they put up, the safeguards they put up, really wasn't good at preventing a smaller number of weapons. And uh, we're living with that today. So uh, this book uh, sort of represents the bookend to the history. Uh, one of the other things I noticed uh, when I taught was that there really weren't any decent books about future trends with regard to proliferation. In fact, they're, they're almost as a denigration of future trends as, well, you know, so-and-so predicted X and it didn't happen. You know, this is, but, you know, any serious field, economics, military science, dare I say it, even political science, tries to establish trends and projects into the future. So I took this on. Now, uh, the first thing I did was try to portray uh, portray the future as grimly as possible. I mean, this, you know, this is, I always like to say that, you know, I, I, tr I work and toil within the, the church of doom and gloom. And yet if you get people's attention about trends, I thought, well, how bad could it get? So I wrote this up. By the way, it turns out very bad. Okay. And I published this in a lot of different places. And I thought, well, you know, we're to zero nuclear weapons now. I mean, Hoover does this all the time, right? The Middle East Treaty. And I thought, well, this would be kind of interesting for them because this would talk about what would happen uh, not only with regard to the spread of nuclear weapons in existing stockpiles, but new ones. Didn't really get a big reception. I think, and I, I keep saying this in hopes that he'll contradict me, but I think Rumsfeld read it. And the reason I say that is he used to serve on a board that gave me money. And he bragged once at a public gathering that he had read everything I had written, which is something, because I don't remember everything I'd written. <laughs> and uh, not only that, but he, he started talking about a sprint to parity, which was a paraphrase of something I wrote, which was a sprint to equality. So maybe he read it. And you know, this notion that as we come down, maybe others will come up, it sort of had a certain currency, which was what I mentioned in the essay. But in general, I have to say, the reception was muted at best. So uh, since I've been working on the book off and on for, I don't know, 14 years, I figured putting it aside a little longer wouldn't matter. And that's what I did. Then I got a request from John Mearsheim at, at my alma mater, uh, University of Chicago. Now, just being asked to go back there was remarkable to me because uh, I have the highest degree you can get there, all but dissertation, ADD. I figured they would never want to see me again. No, they wanted me to talk about uh, an important uh, presentation and what, what I'd like to do. I said, well, you know, I need to write another chapter of this book. Maybe what I need to do is take a look at what people think about nuclear proliferation and what they think about the spread of the nuclear weapons and nuclear war and all of these things because Maybe if I had a better understanding of what people think, I could understand why they don't think very much of what I've written. Uh, so I wrote this. Uh, now, that's the first chapter of the book. There are three schools, roughly. And it doesn't really matter which of these three schools you look at. The ones that don't like nuclear weapons and want to go to zero, the ones that sort of like nuclear weapons or like them a lot, or those who think they're irrelevant, uh, either because they automatically deter or because they don't. Uh, and we'll get into these schools a little. It doesn't matter which school you, you ask uh, for their opinion, the one thing they're unified on is that if you listen to them and their advice, you'll be fine. Now, this sounds kind of crazy to me. I mean, if you know anything about the history of area bombing or the nuclear bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or anything about how governments operate and how we make decisions about military things, I don't think there's anything necessarily that for sure is going to protect us. It's very complicated. We could make mistakes, and we have. That's my sense of it. We're human. We're not built to be perfect, and taking someone's advice isn't going to necessarily save us from ourselves in every instance. So I looked at this, and I say each one of these schools, roughly, uh, 
has something that's really essentially sound, but then gets carried away. So it isn't like you pick which school and then you win. It's like you have to read all of them, and even then you're not done. Um, in the case of the folks that uh, kind of want to go to zero, uh, they have one very important thing on their side. If you've got a bunch of leaders in a room who had nuclear weapons and you ask them, well, what number could we agree on? I wager the only number they would agree on is zero. And this has been recognized by American presidents, both hawkish and dovish. I mean, they've all pretty much said, well, if I had my druthers, I'd like to go to zero. But, of course, they don't have their druthers, and so things don't work out quite so easily. Now, that's the strength. I think where they make a, a bit of a stumble, there's a couple of places, but, but one is they don't really think enough about transitions. In other words, as we come down, what happens if others come up? I always like to say, uh, okay, if you study these things, and I did, I studied under Albert Wolstetter, it really does matter what the quality of these forces are. You know, are will they get knocked out in a year? Will they actually get to their target? Uh, you know, will you be able to actually order them up when you want? There are all sorts of things. But I think Stalin had the final word on this. He said, quantity has a quality all of its own. And I think that roughly the quality of these forces, both crude and advanced around the world, is such that the, the delta between them all is not as interesting as what they have in common. And therefore, the numbers do matter politically at least. And so I think there's a deaf ear to this point. That you know, When people say, well, what does it matter if China gets a few more? Well, it could matter a lot depending on where you are and, and what the trends are. Uh, in addition, uh, there are other other problems uh, which will get, you know which get discussed in the book, you know. Uh, but I think that's the principal one. Uh, now, hawkish supporters of nuclear weapons, uh, they have something that's very very sound. They say the threat of wiping out large uh, numbers of the enemy with these weapons, either in cities or military targets, has kept the peace. Now, at some level, this seems available to common sense. Uh, it must be true at some level. I mean, I just don't know exactly what the level is. Uh, and th that is part of the problem with this argument, which is uh, it's pretty persuasive, but it's, it's very hard, kind of like non-proliferation history, to know what caused something not to happen. Uh, that, I mean, causation may be impossible in a de deconstructionist world, but that one's doubly difficult. Uh, I guess, in addition, uh, they kind of over-argue how having these weapons is useful to keep the peace. I mean, after all, if nuclear weapons deter, more nuclear weapons would deter more, wouldn't they? Better nuclear weapons would deter better. And if they're good for us to deter, wouldn't we want our friends to have them to deter? I mean, pretty soon you can see, oh my gosh, what have we bought into? In other words, one of the problems with this school is they over-argue their case. They don't have the ability to limit uh, the truth that they, they, in fact, are holding up. And so how much is enough becomes a question that they're not that comfortable. All right. Now, uh, they also, I think, downplay the possibility of accidents. Well, I, you know, the first school probably goes way overboard in talking about how this is going to happen tomorrow and we all are going to uh, die immediately because of some accident. I think this school tends to think that we can hold our breath and nothing will ever happen ever. So finally, there's the uh, school that I like the most, the radical academic skeptics. Uh, I like them because they are like good sophists. Uh, they make weak arguments strong and strong arguments weak. And as a result, going after conventional wisdom in this field, they do a lot of useful damage uh, because there are a lot of silly arguments out there. And being almost mechanical in their, their contempt for everything 
they produce some interesting arguments that kind of strike me as sensical. You know, one of them is uh, nuclear terrorism. Really? Uh, that's not that likely. And then they explain why. Well, it's, it's, it's good reading. Uh, inconclusive, of course, but good reading. Uh, however, I think they are too quick to either overplay the deterrent value that it's automatic. You know, as soon as you get these weapons, you're, you're automatically safe or to denigrate them entirely uh, and say, well, they never deter anything, so the spread of these things don't matter. And then they even, in some cases, conclude uh, not only is the spread good, but trying to prevent the spread is bad. Uh, this also strikes me as a little odd. Okay, so in Washington, the only question that matters when you are socializing is the answer to the question, where are you now? Right? How many have heard that question? If you haven't, you haven't been in Washington. Uh, it, it's code for, why should I talk to you? Can you help me get a better job? Right? Well, that's all this is about here. You know? So uh, where am I now is something I feel obligated to answer. Uh, I think roughly uh, where I am is all things being equal, fewer of these things in fewer hands, yeah, better. But the idea that you're going to uh, be able to do this without attention to what the others have, uh, that's kind of nutty. And to get to uh, a world where you are able to put pressure on others to open up and let you know what they have and to come down, I think you're going to have to do a number of other things that we are not doing, not doing. Um, one, I spent a lot of time talking about Asia and China. Well, we have a blind spot on that one. I mean, you know, everything's going to be fine in Asia. I think even a few years ago, some wag uh, in the State Department said, well, we only have to worry about the Middle East. Asia is stable. Well, it doesn't sound right. Um, I think in addition, uh, uh, it would be useful to focus not just on bombs, but I think now on missiles. You know, the missiles are so accurate now uh, with proper conventional munitions, they can achieve strategic missions that previously were assigned to tactical nuclear missiles. Also, they can carry nuclear warheads. Uh, Hoover, uh, which is well known for its association with Reagan, needs to do more here. In particular, there was this president, Reagan, who talked about nuclear missiles. I'm not sure he knew exactly what that meant, but the INF Treaty roughly was a manifestation of that desire to get rid of an entire class of missiles. I think we need to get back to that. I mean, I'm not so sure about missiles based on planes or ships, but the ground-based ones, the ones that allow you to do first strikes most securely, yeah, might be worth looking at. By the way, the Russians think have some positive, useful thoughts in this regard, which is very hard for me to say because I don't generally work with Russians very much. Uh, in any case, you need to tighten the rules on peaceful nuclear activities. I think we just got a taste of what happens when you don't, and we're going to keep hemorrhaging with regard to Iran. Believe me, a 100-page document uh, means two things. The people at the top will not have read it and know what it meant, and the people at the bottom are going to endlessly debate what the hell it means. So that box is not checked. It's just there now, and, and we're going to play in that for a while. But I think more generally, what about countries outside of Iran is something we have not thought about. Actually, the deal with Iran will not work unless we tighten up all the rules, as we have with Iran, with other countries. And, and we haven't given that any thought. Uh, finally, uh, two other points. You want to act early against proliferation, not wait till you have to bomb, or as I like to say, grovel. Uh, if you act early, you don't have to do anything heroic or dastardly. Uh, we don't. We wait until we have proof of a problem, and we shouldn't. And then finally, the point that Harvey brought up, we need to start thinking about an, uh, pushing international law in a way that reflects and fortifies our interests. I think there's too quick of an attempt to say international law is pointless, or to embrace the silliest aspects of it. Um, we need to get back to our roots, so to speak. On that, 
those notes, I will head. Thank you. I think you want to shoot off and give us sure. a pause and let us have your thoughts. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Hoover and thanks to Henry for asking me to, to comment on his book since he doesn't really know what he's going to say about it. But, uh, as a, but my first have to offer a caveat as a Defense Department employee. I have to tell you that uh, my comments today are my own and not the comments of the Defense Department or the National Defense University. Yes, they can be for the record, yes. Uh, you know, as, as was mentioned in my bio, I worked proliferation issues for both the Obama administration and, and the Bush administration prior to that. Toward the end of Bush, it was clear that, well, first of all, if you look at both of those administrations, I'd say clearly say that they are in two different schools, according to Henry type typology. Nobody would put them in the same school. Um, it was clear at the end of the Bush administration that the proliferation landscape had changed significantly over the eight years that had been, been there. And I think it's fair to say that where we are today in the Obama administration, since the Prague speech, the landscape has shifted once again. So where both administrations entered in terms of philosophy, worldview, uh, you know, things moved on from there. And, and what that's taught me is that, that we need to strive to build a nonproliferation consensus that is built less on idealism and beholding to these kinds of schools that, uh, that Henry writes about in his book, and more on pragmatism, uh, that the contours of which we really don't want to vary significantly from administration to administration. And I think Henry's book is a good start of that conversation. So. In, I know you probably all haven't had a chance to read it, but it's uh, it's it's easy to read. <laughs> it's fairly short. It's got nice, pretty pictures, big prints, big, print. <laughs> big, print, <laughs> big <laughs> tables, and everything like such as that. So my son, who is a, 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 an engineer, he's not a, he's not a little kid. He's an engineer. He just graduated from UVA a couple of years ago, um, but he picked this up uh, as we were driving back from uh, a family reunion this weekend, and he got it. He, uh, he really so your articulation of the schools of thought, he had no grounding of this, but he, he really understood from uh, having read that. So I think, first of all, it's useful in the education business. It's useful to, to have people understand uh, what the worldviews are out there. And, and as someone in the, in the education business at National Defense University, I really appreciate that, uh, and it's very useful. It's also helpful in articulating some of the basic assumptions uh, of that people held hold. A lot of times we tend to gravitate to heuristics, to shortcuts in, in thinking, and we really don't challenge what our basic philosophy of thoughts are. Uh, so it's helpful to go back to first principles here. But what most people, you know, I think there's a danger if you just pick it up and, and look at the, the chart, the pretty chart, because you're going to say, well, things are very simple. There's a yes, no, everything's a binary uh, uh, conclusion for each of these schools. When in reality, and I think this is probably Henry's point, uh, the reality is much more complex and much more nuanced uh, of what the landscape is out there, and we need to think that way. So proliferation is not a binary problem. It's not a yes, no. Uh, and there is a, a very complex relationship between the tools for dealing with proliferation, arms control, uh, nonproliferation, deterrence, international law, and then there's other factors that, that come into play, economics, uh, our conventional forces, the status of the U.S. and the world, these are all very interwoven and important. And the bait needs to recognize this and challenge all these basic assumptions uh, that, that are so tightly held. And also contextual factors are very important. Countries make decisions about proliferation not in a discrete manner. Uh, in fact, it's probably a series of small decisions or attempts to keep open their options as long as possible. And if you Henry didn't really describe his middle section uh, of his book, but he really lays out a good description of how a lot of countries are out there trying to keep their options open. Uh, and I think it's very important that we take note of that uh, and we understand that there is no decision that is really a final one. And we want to help them on their path to making a lot of right decisions uh, and changing the path in the right direction, as he says. Uh, so I think it's fair to say there'll be more uncertainty in the international system, and as we see that uncertainty, countries are going to strive even uh, more so to try to keep their options open and preserve those options. 
So one, one option, one thing for possible follow-on research that you might consider, Henry, is uh, you know, thinking about what these schools of thought might look like in other countries, in the countries that are, th are dealing or thinking about proliferation or thinking about nuclear energy and what that might mean and what their neighbors might be doing with regard to nuclear weapons. It'd be very interesting to sort of overlay and juxtapose their thinking uh, along, along with our thinking or with these schools of thoughts to see where they hold up and where they break down when they, when they come across. And I think what you'll find is that we really need some kind of tailored approaches. Um, some cases you need to look to specific countries, but I think more likely uh, we really need to consider regional approaches. Uh, we have to maintain some consistency on our core principles, and we have to include uh, understanding our own realities uh, and our own red lines our and, and uh, how to communicate them, when to communicate them, and how to enforce them. I think that's important. Enforcement is very difficult, uh, and Henry discusses some of the, the challenges with the IEA and their ability to do that. But the international system is going to have to grapple with this e in as we move forward. So will we have a more proliferated future? Henry says yes. I think we're at least likely to have a more well-hedged future with many countries keeping their options open, hedging for the future. Uh, and they'll seek, that res seek to reserve the right to go nuclear. And I think it's more important that we actually look at how do they view nuclear, the value of nuclear weapons. And is that view changing? Because I think what's getting lost in our own debates, bec because we have views that seem to be very static about nuclear weapons, what's being lost is that the view overseas is changing. Russia, China, North Korea, are starting to see them more as a counter to superior U.S. conventional forces and less as a deterrent to other nuclear weapons. So they're, they're increasing their stockpile or they're modernizing their strategic capabilities, which include not only nuclear but also ballistic missiles, space, cyber. Uh, and they're doing that to provide them options against U.S. technological advantages. So nuclear weapons are, are seen as a deterrent, to be sure, but are they seen in other countries as having some military utility? And I would argue that there are some voices out there that say yes. For instance, will North Korea start to move more and look like, uh, as it develops additional cap capability, will it start to look like Pakistan in terms of capabilities, with a variety of capabilities designed to, to deal with a su superior conventional opponent? And that sets up a very dangerous situation. So that sort of the final uh, concluding set of thoughts uh, Henry talks about, and he mentioned in his talk, uh, the need to look at Asia, and I think he's absolutely right. He's right to focus on China and Asia and uh, look at China's view of the strategic, of its uh, strategic forces, and how that view is changing as it seeks to look for a more prominent role in the international order. Proliferation in the region isn't in China's interest either, so I think there might be some room to work with them. And I think an essential goal of our rebalancing effort in Asia should be to limit the strategic arms and uh, competition in the region. So we need to rethink our approaches to arms control. We don't want to throw it out altogether, but we need to rethink it because they're not, as we've done them traditionally, appropriate to Asia. We need to be able to engage multiple parties with a variety of interests. And we really can't forget about the Middle East. We have to think about that because really they're connected. It's connected to Asia. It is part of Asia, and the, the Pakistan link is, is very prominent. And with the Iran agreement today, I think what we're going to see in that region is a jockeying for positions so that 10 years from now when the, or when the agreement expire, expires or starts to expire, there will be countries that will seek to be in a better position vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Uh, and what will that look like? Will it be hedging or will it be something more? There's a lot of hard work on nonproliferation. That hard work starts now. As Henry mentioned, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Egypt, and Algeria all want to invest in nuclear energy and, they, and retain the rights to reprocess and enrichment or en and, and or enrichment. And we need to monitor that very closely and seek to move them off that path. So in conclusion, Henry's right to call for a more hard-headed form of internationalism. And I think the U.S. needs to lead a pragmatic international consensus in dealing with these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, yeah. 
Greg, you've been involved in a hard-nosed diplomacy, as the President described it uh, earlier this morning, and you've also been on the Hill, and you've had a unique vantage point to participate and sort of comment on strategic issues. What, what are your thoughts on that? Thank you, Harvey. I'll just uh, say at the outset that uh, I actually liked the, the book on which we were uh, <laughs> discussing. Um, and I, I started out uh, trying to geolocate myself on the, on the matrix, uh, nuclear proliferation, what we think, you know, find it, which box I'm in. So I thought I owe it to you to uh, confess which box I'm in. Well, I'm the official slash arms control perspective box. Having, having said that, though, I confess to being a little uncomfortable about the confines of this box. <laughs> For example, President Obama clearly is in this box. Uh, Yet there's one aspect of uh, the administration's policy which troubles me. Th there has been no separation from the George W. Bush doctrine of preventive war. Uh, that 2002 change in doctrine still applies. And so uh, Chuck described different schools between the two administrations. I'd say at the same school, maybe they're on different floors. But uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't believe that we are justified in unilaterally attacking countries because we assess they are developing nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe it's just a PTSD hangover from the Iraq WMD, but uh, that's my view on it. I also disagree with those in this box who say we cannot now risk much deeper cuts in our current nuclear arsenal. I think we can. But I also disagree with those who say we no longer need any nuclear weapons. And I also like some of the arguments by those occupying other boxes on the matrix. <laughs> For example, Ward Wilson's audacious challenge to conventional wisdom on the role of nuclear weapons in causing Japan to surrender, in my view, compels serious consideration, even if he's labeled a radical academic skeptic, although now Henry explains that he didn't really mean that in the pejorative sense at all. Well, I just couldn't uh, bring myself to use their term, realism. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I thought that was a little bit uh, too strong, uh, to put it in that, that skeptical spot. So after uh, categorizing current thinking on nuclear proliferation, Henry challenges those who are complacent about our future. And I find his analysis often persuasive. I like his questioning of the apparent consensus that the greatest threat is posed by nuclear terrorism rather than interstate conflict. Presidential candidates Bush and Kerry expressed this consensus in 2004, and conventional wisdom has often affirmed it since then. I notice, for example, that Bob DeLucci in his uh, recent article, America Punts on Nuclear Security in Asia, included an assertion that, quote, the worst horror most of us can imagine is a nuclear terrorist attack on one or more of our cities. Really? <laughs> Clearly, most of us should be able to imagine an even worse horror, a nuclear exchange between any of the world's nine nuclear weapon states. So the more dangerous future Henry anticipates is made vivid in a graphic labeled possible proliferated future. That's page 59. Uh, it's also on your sheet here. Uh, this this nasty <laughs> web. Um, and you see on this, uh, there are uh, lines between uh, 17 future nuclear weapon states uh, creating 136 chances for strategic miscalculation. And I wanted to use this chart as the takeoff point for commenting on the latest big news event relating to our nuclear future, in spite of the discouragement of the <laughs> Iran talk here. Um, I need to mention some critical caveats, of course, that the deal has to survive congressional scrutiny, overcome many challenges during implementation, and retain relevance after 15 years when many of the constraints on Iranian nuclear activities will have been lifted. Nonetheless, I'm confident this agreement will improve prospects for our nuclear future. Some have claimed that the deal is already an encouragement for other countries to demand similar privileges. But it seems to me that the huge economic and political sacrifices Iran has made to develop a complete nuclear fuel cycle offer instead a stark warning. After all this effort and cost, Iran will have neither a clear path to nuclear weapons nor a cost-competitive means for fueling its own reactors. 
Moreover, it could have already achieved a secure fuel supply for its present and future nuclear reactors by now without all the grief. So I don't worry ab at all about the deal being an encouragement to future proliferators. I see it instead as a positive example of what international solidarity in the pursuit of nonproliferation can achieve. Thirty prominent nonproliferation experts judged in early April that the Lausanne Framework Agreement, quote, reduces the likelihood of destabilizing nuclear weapons competition in the Middle East and strengthens global efforts to prevent proliferation, including the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. I agree. And let me conclude by uh, applauding the three general points Henry makes in his final chapter. First, promoting measures that limit strategic weapons prolif proliferation in Asia. Two, encouraging nuclear supplier states to establish strict conditions on further exports of civilian nuclear plants, and three, heading off nuclear proliferation before recognized red lines have been clearly violated. Henry's focus on the fissile material overhang in Asia is appropriate. Pressing China to unilaterally forswear making fissile material for weapons and pushing for an informal moratorium on commercial plutonium recycling are worthy first steps. States which do not already have a nuclear fuel production capability should have viable alternatives for securing a reliable supply instead of pursuing their own uranium enrichment program. I would like to see greater emphasis globally on multilateralizing the nuclear fuel process. Kazakhstan has made a worthwhile contribution in this regard by agreeing to host and operate an international fuel bank facility. This would be owned and managed by the IAEA. For Iran, which has unfortunately chosen to develop its own unilateral enrichment capability, the strictures of the comprehensive agreement will further bend the cost-benefit analysis away from Tehran exercising a nuclear weapons option. Over time, Iran may even see merit in the multilateralization of its own fuel production operations though probably for reasons of power and prestige rather than direct commercial benefit. Although enhancing Iran's mastery of the nuclear fuel cycle has a proliferation downside, multilateralization under IAE auspices would constitute a significant impediment to clandestine breakout. It would be desirable, as Henry argues, for the United States and others selling nuclear reactors to seek the inclusion of a legally binding no enrichment and reprocessing commitment in new agreements and agreement renewals. Unfortunately, securing such a commitment will not be possible in all cases, and here I agree with uh, some of the things that Chuck said about uh, differentiating policy depending on circumstances in the countries and in the regions. Congress could also consider adjusting the review procedures for one, two, three agreements that do not include commitments to forego enrichment and reprocessing, or other key standards such as the additional protocol, so that these agreements would be subject to an affirmative vote of approval. I would note finally and endorse Henry's advocacy of Washington applying the nuclear leverage it has to push broader supplier use of gold standard nonproliferation requirements. So the devil and the debate of course, uh, is in the details, and I hope that we'll have a chance to get into some of them in the Q&A session. Great. Uh, thank you all, and thank you for being so partestimonious in your regard to uh, plenty of time to get the audience involved. I'll just ask one quick question. Um, Henry, there's a paradox that you seem to have been rattling from the Devil's Veto in a French fashion, <laughs> because the book ends with a very interesting analysis in which you say, more or less the problem in Washington is that there is a pathology of mismanagement and that uh, most nuclear weapons proliferation problems are just a, initially are loath to act because they believe the problem is too clear. And then when they finally are convinced that the problem is serious, they conveniently insist there is no solution. That's hence that, pragma that's that pragmatic yeah, Hence <laughs> that it lays into this notion of a policy of mismanagement. Clearly, there have been some policies that have taken place in recent years. Yeah. You advocate, which you regu eloquently laid out, your three policies. But I'm curious from the three participants, since we're on the cusp of what appears to be, as one, uh, I think Henry even described it as a nuclear avalanche, 
and we are having increasing hedging in the system. And if you look over the last 15 years, the one element in your arsenal for a foreign power is if you had nuclear capacity, we, the United States, would not visit you in a projected force manner. That seems to be, that from an international law perspective, the just cogent the norms we're now under. And all, both you in the book and now in this current um, agreement we are putting a lot of weight on the IAEA as being the institution to help be the watchdog for the system. And are we, uh, is that a wise choice or would you like to see other things happen in relation to beefing up the IAEA if that is the path that we're going to go forward in this particular area? So I'll let Henley go no, first. No, 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 you, no, you no. Like go we got to let the pragmatists <laughs> let the and the enthusiasts okay, go first. Okay, let the pragmatists <laughs> and then Henley, you weapon, then we'll open up okay, to questions. Then I'll, then I'll go last. I need to learn. Ah, yes. Well, I, I, I'm somewhat skeptical. Uh, certainly the IEA, uh, IEA, I can't say it today, IEA, EA, I'll get it right, <laughs> the International Energy Council, you can get it uh, right. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, as it's currently structured, postured, it's, uh, it, it really cannot possibly deal with uh, the proliferation or the hedging that Henry describes in his book. Uh, and you know, I'm just not sure that we can plus them up enough to be the, uh, the watchdog, watchdog in which we can base all our pin all our hopes on. So that's that's going to take some other mechanisms, and I think it's going to take uh, a lot of countries working together and sharing information. And uh, I think we're going to have to do it in a more systematic fashion. So uh, there's there's the one hand is is sort of understanding what's going on, getting the site picture, getting the common operations picture, as you say, in the military. But then there's the other important part about what you do about it, whether it's the IEA, EA, or others, other mechanisms. You have to be willing to stand up and do something when it counts. And we shouldn't be doing it in isolation. We shouldn't be doing it unilaterally. But that requires us to be able to build an international consensus well in advance so that there is agreement for some kind of action, um, be it economic sanctions or something more stronger. I guess the first uh, answer is really easy. Uh, do we need to beef up the IAEA? Yes. Um, we have put a lot of uh, responsibility on our shoulders. This, uh, the Iran agreement in particular is, is uh, very complicated. Uh, it's a very intrusive uh, arrangement. The IAEA is going to need some uh, future help. Um, but, I, but I would also emphasize that it's not just that we're relying exclusively on the IAEA to uh, enforce our, our agreements. Uh, all of those things were alluded to are also part of the picture here. Um, having monitored closely the intelligence community for a number of years, I, I assure you that uh, many, many billions of dollars are spent that have uh, nothing at all to do directly with the IAEA in trying to figure out what's going on uh, in uh, nuclear proliferation in other countries. And we've seen failures uh, in the past from the IAEA, the, uh, uh, mis uh, or the underestimation of uh, Iraq uh, before 1990 was one a particularly conspicuous example. But a lot of measures have been taken since then to uh, make up for that error. And uh, in the most uh, recent dust-up in Iraq, uh, the IAEA looks a whole lot better than the U.S. government in terms of uh, assessing what is going on uh, in other countries. So I think the combination uh, with a, a reformed U.S. intelligence community, uh, a beefed-up IAEA, uh, puts us in, uh, in, I think, a decent shape to actually uh, aspire to some of the things we've been discussing in the panel. No, I think the IEA uh, safeguards division needs to be listened to by the people who run that agency. And if they don't listen to them, it's a you know, big problem. And if they did, this is what they'd hear. There are limits to what we can do. You need to be more candid about that, by the way, here in Washington. 
If you say the IEA is safeguarding something, we're done. Even if they can't, and the laws of physics don't allow it. This deal with Iran, my read is it's a gamble. And what you're gambling on is that Iran doesn't and won't want to make nuclear weapons. If they don't and they won't, it'll work. But the idea that there are legal technical barriers in that 100-page document that is going to save your bacon, no, that's not right. It's, it's a political document with a lot of technical bells and whistles parading and masquerading as substance. Okay? It may work because maybe we've now got them committed not to get a bomb because of all of this. But, but it isn't because of the IEA. And the book is pretty good in spelling out why powders, liquids, and gases are really hard to keep track of. And the idea that you're going to be able to do that is kind of fighting the laws of physics, which apply generally even to governments. The other problem is you can abruptly break out when you're on the cusp of having weapons usable materials. So there are limits. The IEA needs to be strengthened so it can be more candid about what it can't do. We're not there. The other thing is if everybody keeps stamping their feet talking about enforcement, we're in trouble. By the time you get ready to think you need to enforce something, you are in a terrible, terrible plight. You need to get, as I say, earlier into the game so you can deflect it so you don't do enforcement. Now, I have a modest proposal. I don't know that I say it quite enough in the book. It would help if we stopped giving everyone an excuse to get to the brink. And we do. Let me give you just one example, and that's it. I was on the Hill yesterday, and although the Iranian matter will probably push this all to the side, we actually are striking a nuclear cooperative agreement with China. You may not know that. You try to keep it quiet, hope it just sneaks through, because if you don't do anything, it comes into force. And that's, that's what everyone's banking on. Congress, they won't do anything. By the way, they're probably right. However, if you take a look at the agreement with China, they were caught in what looks to be a diversion under the existing agreement of civil nuclear technology to help make their submarines better. Now, normally, if you could prove that and someone would admit to that, that'd be it. You're, uh, no more agreement, no more cooperation. So everyone's trying to say, well, it isn't quite as clear as it was. But if you take a look at the agreement, we actually expedite and pre-approve more tech transfers. That's a weird kind of response. And we have advanced consent so they can reprocess and make as much nuclear weapons plutonium as they want without coming back after they get the approval. Well, now wait a minute. This isn't Canada they're talking about. This is China. Well, how does all this happen? Well, because we want to promote peaceful nuclear energy, you see. Can we just, you know, agree that maybe we should stop talking that up so much and in this way. I mean, we've got the point that maybe we shouldn't talk up how wonderful nuclear weapons are to provide security. How about this other stuff? Not on point yet at all. So I would kind of order it that way. Let me open up to questions from the audience. Any thoughts? Yes, ma'am. Which one do you want to Stand up and say who you are so we, we can hear. Okay, the, the well-known thing. Yeah. C.M. Brown, American Security Project these days. Uh, let me dissent a little bit from, before I ask my question, from the categorization approach. I think there are two kinds of people in the world, those who categorize people and those who don't. And I'm in the second group. <laughs> Who's the category? Let's see. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I... I believe that uh, <laughs> all of you are really quite close to one another on the panel, and I think that Henry Sokolsky shows himself really to be a pragmatist mm -hmm. rather than an ideologue for any of these positions. And Greg shows himself also in many respects to be a, a skeptic. Uh, and uh, <laughs> 
That's right. Because I'm in the second I group. Think, I think Geertz would call it thick description. Is That's what right. Thick yeah. description. Thick description. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and um, those who are willing to go to zero, um, that um, willingness is associated with the official position. But look, realistically, they have indicated that as long as nuclear weapons exist, that the United States is going to maintain a robust and effective uh, nuclear capability. And here's where I would like some comments. And uh, to have that capability service extended deterrence and security guarantees. Now, isn't that a problem, though? Uh, having nuclear deterrence okay, and extended security guarantees to discourage proliferation because what we're indicating here is that we really do need uh, nuclear extended deterrence and nuclear back security guarantees in order to persuade you guys that you don't need it. But there's a paradox here because we are, we are saying nuclear weapons are needed. Now, in the existing and uh, emerging international system in which um, today's ally is tomorrow's adversary, uh, the need to hedge okay, is going to be associated with the need to hedge uh, with uh, nuclear weapons, the need to be able to build nuclear weapons. So isn't there a contradiction built into the official policy? As we call it, we call people frenemies in this country, right? Yes, or that docks or hubs. <laughs> And what do you think uh, about this response, uh, first of well, all, Henry? First of all, the paradox uh, question. I think you demonstrated all too well you're not going to get away from categorizing. All right, so you <laughs> failed on your first outing, <laughs> and I just did a better job because <laughs> pragmatism is like everything, and it doesn't describe anything. Now, I have to admit, these groups are pretty rough. I had one guy who called me in a mad panic. Oh, you put me in this category. I said, well, I kind of evaluated it. I wasn't real close, but we're sort of friendly. I said, all right, I'll take you out of the book. And he was relieved. But, I mean, they're, they're rough. And I said, you know, when I tried to explain to him, I said, well, you roughly fit into that. I know you're smarter than a lot of the people that are in that category, but, you know. Uh, so it prompts conversation, just like yours. I think there's some use in that. And the better the categories, always they're going to be defective the better the conversation that ensues in dissecting and criticizing it. So I think I'm going to defend doing that, even though I know it's defective. I okay. mentioned you. Well, what's that? You were really offended. I, I didn't even mention you. <laughs> so that's the first point. The second point is a very important point, more important than the category point. And it, I think roughly it works as follows. Uh, nuclear weapons are really good at fighting the Second World War. You want to do an area bombing? It's really fantastic. You just go to the city, fly over, one does it. Now, we have found that there are other uses militarily for these things. Deep, hardened structures, um, area targets that are a military area target can be used. But I always like to point out, the longer a war goes on, the more you fight with your emotions and your mind, and you start taking revenge. I mean, Hitler had his revenge weapons. We did area bombing. And although that may have been all we could have done then because we didn't know how to aim anything and we couldn't acquire targets, in the future, and even now, you're going to see a transition to lots of things that are not indiscriminate. Um, either you're going to have things that are in low numbers accomplishing the mission with precision, or lots of precise things in high numbers. The problem is, is that it costs a heck of a lot of money. It takes a long time to figure out how to use these things. And only a few nations have begun to master it. I think the United States is doing an okay job, but it took a heck of a lot longer than we ever imagined it would. I remember the first essay on precision guidance was 1972 by James Digby. I said, well, it's been a while, and we're still struggling with it. The Russians have a hard time with it. 
the Chinese seem to be very attracted to it. By the way, the, the introduction is by uh, my old boss, Andy Marshall. They love Andy Marshall. I was there two weeks ago, and when I was introduced as a, someone who worked in his office, well, everybody paid more attention to him. Right? So they're, they're very caught up in it. But it could be, if we're lucky, military science will move war into this arena away from the use of grossly indiscriminate weapons, which roughly uh, are nuclear weapons. And I, I, I was approached the last time I spoke at the Hudson on this book by a Russian, and he said, well, we all know arms control is no longer possible, at least not with us. He was very candid, <laughs> very upbeat. Uh, but maybe we could make the nuclear weapons very, very, very small. I think that was a concession to the trends I'm talking about. And if we're lucky, if we can keep the lid on the kettle, perhaps military science will move in an area that will make relying and resorting and being attracted to these weapons a lot less. I think that's going to take a long time, and that's the reason why we got to pay close attention. And it may not work. It may not work. I'm not saying it's, you know, it's, you know. But that would be my answer to you about the, 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 the dilemma. In other words, there, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, I think. But we got to get there. So Great we have discussion. to jump you in these tanks. Wrap up? Thank you. <coughs> Just a couple of quick points. Uh, first, uh, I think we need to stop, we need to get away from looking at extended deterrence as in nonproliferation for that matter, but as a series of bilateral decisions. Uh, we, we don't do enough to, to really look holistically at, at the region. Um, and we don't, we, we pr provide extended deterrence to. One country, we're providing rationale and justification to another country as to why they should get nuclear weapons. So we have to we have to think through that very carefully and and look through as Henry showed in this picture the many pi many player problem. Uh, in terms of your thoughts about military science, uh, I don't have a lot of <laughs> faith that military science or that the discussions are are going in the right direction. I think. We in our military to military talks need to have a more robust discussion about why these weapons are not useful, why they should not be used militarily. Uh, and we need to let that discussion get out in the writing so that those that we don't have military to military relationships can understand that as well. Um, unfortunately, within our military today, I have to say, we've lost our capacity really to think about the nuclear problem as a war fighting or as a military problem. And that's very disturbing because our, our adversaries are thinking about it. Uh, and if we're not thinking about it at the war colleges, if our generals aren't thinking about it, then they're not going to know how to deal with it when it happens. And uh, we need to get back to understanding why we need to stay away from it on the battlefield. Can we play a thought strike on that? I li what I would call the Brown paradox that Henry was very American when he said, don't worry, technology will solve the war. <laughs> I would just say about uh, paradox, uh, I, I don't see how it can be separated from any aspect of the, of the nuclear dilemma we face. And I guess I embrace uh, advice an old college professor gave me that uh, when you see something as being ironic, you're beginning to understand. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. With international investor. Henry, I, I brought this up once before with you, but I, I'd be interested in what uh, your fellow speakers have to say on this subject. Um, we, we wonder if uh, there are some leaders long past and some present who have great regrets at not pursuing their nuclear weapons programs. We're thinking of Gaddafi in Libya, Syria, even Ukraine at this point. Not that they really possess them for use, but just having them on their on their soil might have changed some the complexion at least of some some events. So my question really is, um, do we worry that other leaders around the world have looked at these situations and asked themselves, uh, or just said to themselves, "We're not going to let our ourselves fall into the same pattern," and that? Clearly, by having nuclear weapons, it puts you in a different club that gains more respect. So uh, I just wonder if, if either or all three of you have any thoughts on that. 
And uh, just a corollary question to that would be, how certain are we that there aren't more clandestine programs taking place uh, even in a limited form around the world? I think absolutely we need to be concerned about that. Uh, you know, I had a lot of experience in dealing with the North Korea problem uh, 2008 to 2010. And it's obvious that there was a couple lessons learned out of our experience from Iraq. Uh, Libya took uh, one path, North Korea took a different path. And North Korea regime is still in power, so they're going to feel vindicated. Now, it's still isolated, but that doesn't seem to, to, to matter much to them. Uh, I think being isolated is better to be being than being dead, as the, uh, their calculus would probably be. So we, and particularly, you raised the uh, the idea of Ukraine. I think that one is particularly egregious. I mean, there was one area, th or one agreement that that we were party to. The Russians were party to, and and we we didn't hold the Russians uh, accountable for that uh, for that agreement. So we have to, I, I think really kind of put ourselves in the place of these leaders and figure out how we address their concerns in something that's much more than lip service. Can you provide some sort of guarantees? Um, we tried to do that with the North Koreans. They don't see them as valid, and I think their, their history probably bears that out. But uh, there's got to be more dialogue in thinking through why having nuclear weapons is not going to be beneficial for them uh, as opposed to sort of through actions having them, showing them a way in which they, they might be, which is what would seem to have been done in the past. Greg, you want to say anything? Uh, I would just say that I, I think uh, the North Korea example shows what a big problem this is. I mean, the conclusions that countries like North Korea uh, draw from Libya and uh, others and of course, they've said that explicitly. So uh, it's definitely a problem. I, I guess I think that we can also overreact to this problem by uh, misunderstanding Ukraine. I mean, nuclear weapons would not have helped Ukraine avoid the loss of Crimea. Uh, nuclear weapons uh, were, were not really what the, uh, the Russian annexation and uh, the use of little green men were all about either. So uh, I don't really see that as being a, a story about nuclear weapons. The political commitment did involve nuclear weapons, of course, but I also disagree that uh, that our reaction was just lip service. I mean, uh, if you're sitting in Russia today, I think it looks like a lot more than lip service what has happened uh, economically uh, as a result of the sanctions. So uh, I think there are a lot of things uh, short of, uh, of, of, of combat that uh, penalize countries for violating international law. I would build on these two comments. I think it's not only the case that what ailed Ukraine would probably not be healed with possession of nuclear weapons. I think what ailed Libya, uh, similarly, it would not be the case that if they had nuclear weapons, uh, oh well, Libya wouldn't have fallen apart. I mean, if anything, we'd just be more on edge, I suppose. Uh, and I think North Korea as well is holding together, not because of nuclear weapons, but a lot of other reasons. So I think being more candid about that would be the first place to start. Now, on the, to, to build up your point, though, I would go a different route. You didn't mention Brazil. Brazil actually was drawn to these things. I remember uh, talking to uh, a very important man in Brazil, I'll protect his name, who actually was responsible for killing the program. And he told me that three years later, after we did the India deal, the generals uh, had a meeting that he was at, and one of them came up and put his finger right on his chest and he said, the Indian deal, you see, it was a mistake. We could have had our weapons. So I think if you're serious about the point, there are a lot of other things we should be concerned about than just security guarantees to countries that forego. I think we have to kind of de-emphasize the importance of these things for regime preservation, number one. And number two, that the route to prosperity and, and a sound governance uh, isn't necessarily enhanced by these things. I think if you make a case that way, you're going to get more traction than 
trying to say that these things are critical in a way that maybe they're not. Uh, the Hoover people just signaled to me that we have to wrap up the session. Uh, as you can see, the lunch has arrived, and we're going to be having a working lunch, uh, in which I think the keynote speaker has arrived too. Yeah, uh, at 12, Lord Brown, a very informer, UK Secretary of State for Deterrence and Vice Chairman of the Nuclear Threat Industry. So we'll continue the nuclear discussion. I hope I want to thank you all for participating in sort of the debate that's now been opened with the um, Iran deal, which is where are we headed and what will help. And as you questions have pointed out to the panel, we're at the brink of a new era, I think, of the nuclear era. And where it will end will be as a result of the people in this room and the people on this panel helping to contribute to what makes the most sense. So please join me in thanking our distinguished panel for helping to kick off this discussion. <laughs>